for for those that um, I haven't had a chance to interact with directly, um, I'm Andrea Wilkins. I'm the legislative liaison with the State League. Um, unfortunately, uh, Maude and Beth are a little under the weather today, so they won't be joining us, but um, we'll be sharing some notes from the meeting and um, conveying the thoughts back to them. So everybody stays up to speed on the conversation. And um, since this is just the second meeting of this group, um, maybe it'd be helpful if we just did a quick round of introductions, including um, your local league. I know some of you have it posted um, along with your name, but um, just so we kind of have a sense of what sort of regional diversity we have, that's always helpful to know. Um, Hannah, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, sure thing. Um, hi, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Hannah. I'm the operations manager for the State League. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for me. <laughs> but I'll just go ahead and we can kind of just call on people. So when it's your turn or after you've finished speaking, just call on someone else. Um, so next to me is Jennifer. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Patterson. I'm a new member to the group as I just recently moved to Colorado. Um, I live in Centennial, so I don't know what that um, district is to you guys. Maybe. Um, Jennifer, are you a league member or, or no? Yes, I joined the league. Oh, okay, maybe the Arapaho Douglas League. Does that sound right? It might be that one. <laughs> Well, in any case, you are more than welcome. <laughs> okay, okay. I think that's the one. I'm in the same one as Maud. Yep, that's it. Okay, all right. <laughs> Great, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, let's see, let's just go down the line here. Um, Joanne, you are next on my screen. I'm Joanne Vondrasek and I'm in Adams County. Great, thank you. Uh, how about Shelly? Hi, I'm Shelly Shaw, and I am in um, the La Plata County. I live in Durango, so La Plata County, and I am probably about two days old to the league. I just joined myself, so excited to, to get involved. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Betty, let's go over to you. Uh, Betty Seelan with the Jeffco League. Great. And uh, Christina. Christina Manthe, Jeff Co-League. Um, and Jennifer, just for your information, I actually live in Douglas County. So, you know, that's why there's sometimes we have to ask questions where people live. <laughs> uh, Jerry. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerry Cummins. I'm with the Arapaho Douglas League and former uh, Board of Service Chair on the State Board. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Gathia, you're up next on my screen. Okay, I'm Gathia Weiss and I'm in Boulder County, Long Run. Thanks, Gathia. Uh, Kelly. Kelly, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but um, it looks like you're on mute, so we can't hear you. Yeah, and I'm multitasking, so I was working at my desk. Um, I am from La Plata County. My name is Kelly Hegarty. I've been a member, you know, I think I, I think I originally touched base as soon as I got to Durango, but I've been in the Four Corners area since 1979, but uh, La Plata County League of Women Voters, I think for about two years now, just kind of getting involved directly with your committees just the last couple of months. Great, thank you. Um, let me interrupt the introductions uh, for a text we have to address. Uh, Hannah, would you mind sending the meeting link to Karen Cheek? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, Hope. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hope Shuppelman. I am from the La Plata County um, League of Women Voters. I am also very brand new. This is my first week with you all. Um, and I want to apologize. I do not have my camera on because my connectivity is really um, soft on that. Oh, no worries. We all experience that from time to time on Zoom. I'll probably experience it myself sometime during this call. I feel like it happens at least once a day. Uh, let's see, Susan. I'm Susan Stark from Denver League of Women Voters. Great, thanks, Susan. 
Well, some of you um, new members and um, longer term members alike have uh, had amazing stamina <laughs> and attendance at all of our task force meetings, which has been great. Uh, so we thank you for joining in. Um, on this discussion. Um, one of the things we'll be talking about is the date and time for our next meeting. Um, we'll get to that before we end the call, but um, it's nice to have um, a lunchtime meeting, I think, as opposed to all the evening meetings that have been happening. And um, the lunch hour has um, allowed us to um, avoid some conflicts. So uh, we'll have to have a discussion about whether or not that works for people for the long term. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm seeing a few more people log in. Um, Barbara, did you want to do a quick introduction um, with Local League? Uh, Barb, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, hi, Barbara Dungey from Arapaho and Douglas counties. And I'm just very glad that we're doing this, especially on a day like today when uh, we've got the oral arguments. So um absolutely uh just you know just really want to see what we can all do together in colorado here great thank you so much uh let's see celeste hello everybody uh i'm celeste landry i'm from the uh boulder county league and very interested in election issues Thanks, Celeste. And Karen. Muted. Karen, you're on mute. When will we ever finish doing that? I'm, you're on mute. Uh, I'm Karen Cheek. I'm from the Montezuma County um, League, and I'm also on the board for Local League Support. I served on the White Paper Committee that developed Colorado's uh, uh, stellar and innovative election paper, and I also served on the election security position committee. So I am, um, of course, very much interested in seeing that we get the word out on both of these areas. <laughs> Great, thank you, Karen. Um, is there anyone on the call that I missed? Okay, I think that's everybody. Um, and then if we have someone uh, join a little bit late, uh, we'll just break uh, quickly for um, an introduction of whoever else might join. Um, I mentioned previously, but for those who um, weren't on um, a little before uh, the 12 o'clock hour, um, I put some bullet points in the chat. It's just sort of a rough agenda to give you all a roadmap of some of the things that we were hoping to touch base on. Um, certainly not set in stone. Um, we definitely want to hear ideas and priorities from the group. So we can absolutely feel free to deviate from this, but we did want to give you kind of a sense of uh, some of the things that um, Hannah and I were brainstorming and wanted to check back on um, following our um, initial meeting. Uh, one of the things that seemed to be really clear as, um, you know, we had that first conversation and we reflected on our meeting notes was um, the big desire by this group to, um, you know, really dig into the special districts issue and, um, you know, figure out how we might focus that discussion. It's obviously um, a big issue. Oh, Celeste, I see your email. It looks like it's not coming through for everyone. So, let me paste that in again. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, yes, so um, as I was saying, special districts was definitely one of the, the key issues that um, we heard from you all loud and clear that um, is an area that you think needs some attention and um, this group probably wants to explore further for, um, you know, possible action and, um, you know, figuring out what, what we do with this, this issue in Colorado. Um, one of the other things that I think is saved for later in the agenda, which given the fact that we only have an hour, we may or may not have time for, and it may have to wait for another, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that you all did place a lot of importance on, um, you know, the um, high quality of Colorado's election system and the usefulness of us providing education and looking for ways to um, help replicate 
some of the strategies and methods that we use in Colorado to other areas that really could benefit from some election improvements. Um, I think that's an area that's going to take more brainstorming. So I put it at the bottom because um, I think we have some issues that are a little pressing in time that we want to discuss today. But I do want everyone to know that we haven't overlooked that. It is um, if on the back burner temporarily, but uh, definitely something that we want to revisit with all of you. Um, on the topic of special districts, I think we want to kick off there. Um, we're really hoping to, you know, just have the opportunity to regroup with you all on that um, to figure out now that we know this is one of our priorities, how do we focus our efforts here? Um, what does this conversation look like? What might be the priorities of the group? And um, are there areas uh, for possible action that are coming to mind? Um, Hannah and I also discussed the possibility of um, an educational presentation on this topic, possibly being um, really useful, um, if that's something that would be of interest to you all. And um, Hannah has a very good resource close to home on this, <laughs> so I'll let her say a little bit about this. Yeah, so um, my dad is a real estate development and special districts attorney. Uh, he him and his firm focus mainly on like small municipalities, um, public transportation authorities, local governments, that type of stuff. Um, with that said, do I know what any of that means? Eh, maybe. So him coming would be very informative for a lot of people, but I, that's kind of the most information I can give at this time as to kind of what he does. Um, but I will talk to him tonight and see if, that would be something he could possibly do. And if not him, someone from his firm to come and talk, um, especially because the special districts that they represent, they do all the elections for. Um, so that would be something that would be of interest, I would think. Um, so yeah, but I would love to hear everyone's opinions um, if you think that that's something that would be beneficial to this group and if that's something you all wanna do. I, for one, would love to hear more about it. I, this is one of the, this task, the special districts is the area that I particularly am interested in. So I'd love to hear his take on everything. I think that would be very beneficial. I do too. I agree. I just feel like I don't know much. So we might have to, he might have to start at square one. <laughs> I, I think that's a great idea. Christina, you're bringing up? Yes, um, since Jeffco's already done one presentation on this, would it be helpful to circulate our EMM and mm -hmm. discussion leader notes that we put out? It's almost two years old, that particular thing, but I could certainly send that to Hannah and she could circulate it to everyone as a starting mm -hmm. point. I mean, it's geared definitely towards Jeffco, but it, and it's two years old, so. I think that sounds like a great idea, Christina. Yeah, yeah the more information, the better. Um, that you know, we also recognize. Well, if Fair were here, she'd have a hissy fit, I'm sure, because she's so biased against anybody that is in the industry, and I kind of realize that. So, I'm kind of glad she's not here today. Uh, Betty, I see a hand up yeah. on her. Um, you know, I'd like to ask Hannah: Does your deal, dad deal with metro districts? Because it seems like those are the ones from our studies and looking into this that have the most problems. He does, uh, I'm looking on his website now to see his clients because I don't remember. I know some of them because I did work for him for a couple of years, but um, he does, some of them are more um, in the mountains, which is still very applicable to a lot of our, our leads, but uh, yes, some metro districts, um, like some in Edwards, Vail, Eagle, Cordillera areas, um, he does some. Um, but I will ask him when I talk to him about the presentation uh, to kind of emphasize that too a little bit more. Yes, and I think we would have to have a good list of questions that we might want to ask. Seeing you know if we're relating it to the elections, just just how those um, how his his firm is involved with the actual elections. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, thank you for that, Betty. Uh, let's see, Susan, you've got a hand up. Um, we need not have just one person. If we had a second speaker that specialized more in metro districts, you know, we could um, 
bring that person into a panel discussion with Hannah's father. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I don't, I can't give you the name of anybody. But. <laughs> right. yes, but that's, that's great. And I can also ask him too, because um, if, if he's aware of any uh, other firms that do or primarily focus with, uh, with Metro districts, if he has a friend or a colleague or anything like that, that he could let us contact or something like that, or at least just get us in the right direction. But I think that's great. Anna, what's the name of your father's firm? Uh, it's I Snaggle C. Group Hogue. I can send um, his website link in the chat. Yeah, I think the idea uh, for a panel or uh, multiple speakers is really great. That's something that Hannah and I had talked about a little bit as well. Um, so if uh, people have specific suggestions or a speaker that you um, may have run across, please let us know. Um, but we can also, you know, solicit other suggestions outside of the group or um, do some inv investigation into that um, if you all are interested in more of a panel style presentation. Uh, Celeste, I see a hand up. Um, I wonder if the Jeffco group um, dealt with the special districts association at all, and because certainly we'd want at some point to engage with them because they're very involved. This is what their whole purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael Valdez is a person I've spoken to there. No, we did not. And yes, I think we might want to involve the special districts group. Mm -hmm. um, we, their current chair was formerly the chair of the Jeffco, Jeffco Economic Board, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we actually received a communication from her um, suggesting such a meeting. Take her up on it. <laughs> well, we needed to find the other side too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the special districts association tends to side with the, mm -hmm. the special district right. leadership. Yes, definitely. And the, de and the developers in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. That fair might have an in on somebody who would be a good speaker. John Henderson is a lawyer that I know that has worked in Jefferson County on some of those things, but I've never really heard him speak. <laughs> Um, well, I'm taking notes about all of these suggestions, but um, as thoughts come to mind, of course, you know, let's continue the discussion. Feel free to, um, you know, put that out um, directly. Um, but also, if ideas come to you after the fact, just let Hannah and I know. One of the things that's a priority now on the special districts is the um, ability to submit your as a candidate opens on December 28th, roughly. And it's open until roughly February 28th. That's approximate dates. And that is always a key problem in the special districts is finding candidates to run for office and making people aware that they should be interested. That may be too late for us to do anything about it for 2023, but certainly something to keep in mind for 2025. And then the next big issue is making people understand the importance of voting mm -hmm. on these. And how we start a campaign on that is, I'm not sure, but you know, right. that would be the next step. Our example is a West Metro Fire District, which has like 260,000 people in the district or something like that. And they had 286 people or something like that vote um, in, in the last dis district election. And, and the, self, the nominations are a self nomination, you nominate yourself. So it's really a very simple process if people are aware of it. I, I'm worried about people not being aware of it because what happens is they, the developers or whoever wants to control the agenda picks their single candidate for each seat and then they cancel the elections because they don't have any competition. Mm -hmm. And so then you don't have to remember to vote because there's no election. <laughs> Can I actually interject, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, who's so, speaking? This is Hope, Hope Shuppelman. So I am a novice at all of this, especially when it comes to elections. Um, again, I'm only a week in with you all. Can, um, 
and I hate to ask, but I always know that asking questions is not not um, is actually important. <laughs> Can somebody explain to me what special elections is? I'll take it. Because I'm, I'm, I'm just starting from base one. In Joe, you want to take it? I can. Did somebody else want to jump in on that? I was going to start it. Um, so special elections are in Colorado. We have the general election in November, but our government formation is that we have state structure and then we have the municipalities and counties and things like that. But then we have what are called special districts and they can be fire districts, cemetery districts, water districts, and then the metro districts. And those elections take place in the spring of the odd years. And there are roughly 4,000 special districts in Colorado. They do not fall under, our normal November elections fall under the category of the, the, the Secretary of State. These elections do not fall under the Secretary of State as a general rule. They fall under the Department of Local Affairs. Jerry, you want to take it from there? Well, I was just going to add that what I have run into is people don't know what a special district is to start with, and you've sort of touched on it. Uh, special districts are formed for a specific purpose. <coughs> Christina mentioned uh, fire, uh, water, sewer, uh, cemetery. There's a district. A lot of them are fairly small, but many of them are, several of them are fairly large. Um, and if you're in the metro area, a lot of people aren't aware that RTD is classified as a special district, although they have their elections in uh, November. Um, Scientific Cultural Facilities District is another special district. So that if that's helpful, I'm not sure. At, by all means, ask all the questions you want. Thank you so very much. That is actually very helpful. Appreciate it, ladies. Well, one of the reasons the metro districts are of such concern is they're formed generally by the developer of an area to put in the, the streets and sewer and water for those areas. And the financing of it becomes problematic sometimes. And, and I'd like to add that one of the reasons we have metro districts and that they're a problem now is because of Tabor. Before Tabor, you know, local authorities, government authorities would take care of the infrastructure and you'd pay for that when you bought your home. Well, with Tabor, nobody wants to increase their taxes to pay for additional development, which supposedly would take pay for itself once it got established. And so the Metro districts are formed to provide that kind of infrastructure at the beginning of a development. And that's why they're so rampant now in Colorado since Tabor was passed in 1990, 91 or something like that. So if you're new to Colorado, you have to figure on Tabor and learn about Tabor because it influences so much of what, what happens here. And for those that those of you that are new, um, we do have um, some discussion around Tabor in um, the LWVCO program book. Um, and we can also point you in the direction of other resources. CFI, uh, Colorado Fiscal Institute, has got some good information on Tabor. Um, you know, it's just something that impacts so much of Colorado government. It's a really important thing to familiarize yourself with if you are new to the state. Uh, Susan, I see a hand up. And um, are these becoming even more crucial as we face water shortages and other and transportation issues and um, uh, those kinds of things? Is that also part of why if developers are themselves developing special districts and they of course want house to build houses and sell them, um, in the long term, isn't that one of the problems that we will have in Colorado too? Well, we know a developer recently acquired one of the water districts. Yeah. Um, so. so, you know, this could very well be a problem. Right. So I'm just saying there is there is likely greater impact as well um, that should concern us as as climate change and other things impose um, on us. Great. That, that's a really important point. Thank you for raising that. 
Um, in the chat, there's a question about um, where we can see all the special districts. Two places that I can recommend, and it depends on where you're at, and I don't know how good your county records are. Um, first of all, the Department of Local Affairs maintains a list of all of the um, special districts that I supposedly all of them. The other place I go for Jeffco is there is the tax, the treasurer has a distribution list of every group that he pays out money to. And that was my source. It also gives the rate on that particular, in the Jeffco list of what the mill levy rate is for that particular district. And that is also quite interesting when you look at that. And I would like to see if we go ahead and do have a panel or people, I would like to see it structured so that it can get down to the local leagues. Being, being the program chair for Jeffco, um, the state task forces are, are great for feeding stuff to the LAC, but I want <coughs> information to get down to the local level and help the local leagues. So, um, so anything we set up, um, I'd like to have a local league component in there to get this information to the local league so we can use it in our programming. Uh, Benny, what exactly are you envisioning there? Are you thinking, you know, just outreach to the local league so we ensure that there's an attendee from the various local leagues or would, are you actually thinking like a, a, a local league specific presentation? Well, if we do, if we do have speakers come in on special districts, if we could set it up like a webinar or YouTube or however, however it's done. So the local leagues, we could um, reuse that information for our members or at least advertise it as a meeting um, scheduling ahead of time so we could put it into our program so members could be sure to tune in to it also. Either at the actual time that we do have these people speak to us or at a later date. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So you're you're thinking more of like a statewide meeting as opposed to uh, that would be sponsored by the task force, um, but nothing that would be confined to this uh, time frame and you know just advertised amongst the group. Right, available yeah. to the local leagues. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, any other thoughts or discussion on this? I might want to add just a little bit more information for Hope and for others. At least in my county, and I think probably in the whole metro area counties, the development for residential uh, areas occurred in unincorporated counties. And counties didn't really have the authority to provide things like water and, or not water, but fire and whatever. But uh, there was a need for fire districts to come into play for fire protection and water services, library services. And that was the, the special districts were the, was the vehicle to provide those services in the unincorporated county. Since then, some of these areas have incorporated into uh, communities, in my case, Centennial. And, uh, and in the case of Centennial, the city does not cover any of those services, but the special districts were kept in place. So, you know, there's a whole history behind the creation of special districts. Thanks for that background, Jerry. I think it really emphasizes how complex the issue is and how um, when we're thinking about our speakers, we we do need to make sure that we're including that baseline information. Um, and I, I, if you have thoughts on, you know, speakers or, um, you know, structure that would please don't hesitate to reach out. That'd be really helpful. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, well, um, keep any ideas coming our way as they might occur to you. Um, Hannah and I will regroup with Beth and Maude on this and start to put a little more structure around it. 
but um, this is a lot of great information and I think it gives us um, a really good sense of um, you know, where we want to head with this and um, great feedback from you all that this is something that uh, you'd like to see happen. Um, so we will be providing information as we uh, continue down the road on this. Okay, um, moving to the next bullet point. I'm sorry, was there a question or comment? Oh, okay, I thought I heard something. Just yell at me if there is. Um, moving to the next bullet point, um, you'll see reference to um, the Perkins Coie lawsuit against the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. um, I Somewhere on one of my many tabs, um, I have a CPR article that kind of summarizes it nicely. Um, and I'll drop that in the chat for people that may not have seen that and would like to take a look. Um, this is more just kind of um, an awareness type of thing. Um, the lawsuit was filed in Denver District Court on December 2nd. And uh, the plaintiffs are an organization called the Vet Voice Foundation. And there's a couple of individuals that are named at, in their individual voter capacity. And then um, the defendant obviously is uh, Jenna Griswold in her um, capacity as the Secretary of State. Um, the allegation is that uh, votes in Colorado are being unlawfully discarded because of problems matching the signature verification. Um, and there's, I guess, heightened concern about, um, you know, some evidence or the potential for disproportionate impact um, to diverse voters, uh, disabled individuals, and young people. Um, right now, we, um, there doesn't seem to be much information available on the secretary's response. Uh, the statement that they had put out is that they're reviewing it. And um, they did make note of the fact that Colorado voters do have the opportunity to cure any irregularities in their ballot. Um, so I certainly think that there will be more to come on this. Um, some of you may be aware of the fact that um, Perkins Coie had reached out to LWVCO and a couple of other organizations about potentially joining this lawsuit. And the board decision was that that was not something that we wanted to do, um, but that, you know, we, given the, the fact that we have a good working relationship with the Secretary of State, um, you know, we, we felt a better strategy would be to try and work alongside them to address any problems that might exist and um, look to improvements that may be possible in the system, as opposed to jumping to a lawsuit that, you know, may end up being a contentious thing that impedes our ability to work with the Secretary's office going forward. Um, so just a little history on that. But, um, you know, again, we really just kind of wanted to make everyone aware of this. Um, if you take a look at the article, um, you'll see that, um, you know, in the secretary's response, she's noting that eight day time frame that voters have to cure their ballot um, through text to cure. Um, the uh, CPR, article, uh, CPR article makes reference to longer um, cure periods in other states, such as Oregon and Washington, which I believe have a 14 and 21 cure, uh, cure period, respectively. Um, so there's potentially some things that could be done, but um, we just wanted to make everyone aware of it, see if anybody had any specific thoughts or questions. Um, and um, something I think we'll probably want to discuss as this moves along. And eventually, um, you know, when we get to a point where we kind of see what the secretary is doing with this, um, you know, we, we hope that there would be room for conversation if we have specific concerns that we think um, could be addressed in areas that could use improvement um, to reach out and um, maybe be part of the solution on that. Susan, I see a hand. Um, I, and Jerry, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's eight days after election day. It's not just eight days. You, you can cure up to eight days after election day. That's correct, Susan. Mm -hmm. and the thing that does sort of always concern me is that people are notified that they need to cure something about their ballot, most likely the signature. They are notified by mail. And I think there's a real time lag there that could be addressed somehow. Can they notify people other than by mail? Hmm. That seems to be a really a key area of maybe some possible reform 
these you know improvements to that notification process potentially alongside maybe an expansion in the cure period. I, I, I'm not sure exactly um, you know off the top of my head different ways of approaching that, but I, I think that's a great uh, great point, Jerry. Um, let's see. I see a whole host of hands. Um, Hope, I think you were first. Hi. Um, so I actually was part of uh, Text to Cure. I was curing ballots here in the La Plata area. And I know Kelly was one of them as well. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things I do have to add about that. A number one, when people register here in Colorado, we need to make sure that when, when there is an election that's coming up, we need to make sure that we get their accurate address, their an accurate phone number, and an accurate email address. I, when I went to Cure Votes, um, there are a couple of people that already got the um, Cure Their Vote via an email, um, <clears throat> and that was great. However, the caveat to this is they were really skeptical of this because, you know, voting and voting and integrity is really huge and it's and it's on the plate. And that's why we're all here as well. People were really worried about what is this? What is going on? Why are you asking me about this? Why are you asking me to upload an ID? Why are you asking me to sign on a little little pad for text to cure? So those are the things that I just kind of wanted to give. Thanks, Hope. Uh, yeah, it sounds like some of this could maybe kind of points to an education effort around, um, you know, how people can, you know, can get that verification that they should be looking out for this and um, you know, really the importance of following up. Um, Karen, I see a hand up. Mm. Yes, I I was under the impression, I had talked with Hillary Ruddy, who's the deputy director for elections at the Secretary of State's office, and had had a conversation with her about text to cure. And one of the things that she shared with me was that she thought that maybe their office hadn't done as good a job as they needed to, to let people know that text to cure was an option. I thought that I had had a conversation with, um, with Beth about this as far as the state league was concerned. I don't know what we did at the state level to help get the word out on text to cure or what the secretary of state's office did. So I'm, I'm wondering if this is something in addition to some of Hoke's concerns, if, if this is something that we could actually be of vital assistance in, in promoting and get, getting the word out to, um, you know, voters in our local league areas, because it's uh, so many people do use technology that this seems like it would be a really quick and easy way for people to be able to to follow up if they get, you know, to, to be notified and then also to follow up to get it done. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Kelly, I see a hand up. Yeah, you know, I was just going to mention, kind of tagging on to both uh, prior, what they had mentioned as far as education, the league would be like the ideal group to come into county clerks and say, hey, look, we're a nice group of volunteers, nonpartisan, let us help you. Because when we've found things that maybe the information for contact was incorrect, we brought it back to our county clerk and they're, they're kind of their hands are tied, right? They can't they can put people on an inactive list, but they really can't update without that person coming in. Um, but our county clerk's very receptive to help. It's just, it would have to be in a nonpartisan fashion where you have a, and like I say, the, the league would be an ideal group to, to be willing to volunteer to the individual county clerks. So, so maybe that's where our legwork can happen in the counties. Yeah, absolutely. These are all great points. Um, sorry, real quick, I just want to jump in. I think these are all awesome. And um, from this past election with Text Secure, we did at the state level do some social media stuff on both Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter in terms of really laying out. We had infographics explaining exactly how to use Text Secure and then like what you would need Text Secure for. Um, but, you know, the technology only goes so far. Some people aren't on Facebook or Instagram or aren't going to check that or see that after we've already posted it and then don't get their notification that they need to cure their ballot. You know, there's a, there's a time frame kind of thing. So I agree that 
um, maybe more hands-on stuff rather. I mean, I think promotional stuff on social media, emailings, that type of thing is always great. And we can always do more of that. But I, I really like the idea of kind of being more hands-on with kind of clerks. Um, and then even to like working more closely with the SOS office um, on maybe some sort of campaign, if you will, for tech secure and making sure more and more people are aware of, of what that's for. Thanks for that information, Hannah. Yeah, a multifaceted approach, I think, is really key here, trying to reach people in all different ways. Uh, Susan. Um, when I was an um, election uh, watcher, poll watcher at the Denver division, um, there was some discussion of issues around so many people whose only other signature that they maybe have online is through motor voter. And the machines at Motor Voter are very awkward to sign an actual signature on. And so that there was some discussion about maybe they needed to upgrade those machines or something to um, enable people to actually, and people are used to just, you know, using their finger and doing nothing when, when they say, you know, you've bought something and they say sign here and you don't really sign your signature. So that was one of the issues. One of the other issues is regarding young people without teaching um, cursive writing in school anymore. Many young people don't write out signatures. They aren't used to doing it. They don't have checkbooks. They, you know, um, they do a lot of online things. So maybe the signature itself is an outdated technology by which to check people's identity. So there was also a little bit of discussion about what alternatives might be possible there that aren't intrusive. But um, so, you know, I think this, from what I heard, the Secretary of State's office is not unaware that there are some challenges uh, technologically or logistically that have increased the numbers of signature mismatches among certain populations. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, Christina. Yeah, coming out of the Department of Revenue, that's, the signature pad is a DOR decision point, you know, mm -hmm. but perhaps what we could encourage them to do is have signage up that says this sign, your signature is used to compare in other places as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, getting the Department of Revenue to spring money on equipment is like. Yeah. Yeah, th that's a great point. I, I, full, I can think of all the times that I have just kind of scribbled <laughs> on there. And so an education effort around, you know, why you really need to make sure that your signature looks like your signature um, would be a really valuable thing. Um, other comments, questions on this? Okay, well, um, this is something that we'll continue to monitor. Um, and I'm sure will be a topic of um, future discussions as this group continues to meet and this situation starts to play itself out a little further. Um, okay, one of the things that I definitely wanted to get to before we end our call today is the issue of um, trying to reinstate 17 year old voting uh, for individuals in, in presidential primaries for individuals that will be 18 by the general election. Uh, we spent some time talking about this um, during our initial meeting, but um, I, I think we are, if, if this is something that we want to move on, um, I do think that we need to act sooner rather than later. So um, I think it'd probably be great to get a sense from the group, um, you know, how we want to go about this. Um, for those that did not um, hear the discussion uh, during that first meeting, um, LWVCO and and um, some members of the LAC specifically have been exploring options to um, try and undo what we believe was an unintended consequence of Amendment 76 that was focused on limiting the, uh, the right to vote to only citizens, but in the process um, invalidated the ability of almost 18 year olds uh, to vote in primaries. So we, we feel like that is something that, you know, while covered in the blue book was something that most voters were not focused on since the campaign was very focused on non-citizens non having the ability to vote. 
Um, so it's something that we'd really like to address, um, you know, as part of our organizational goals and priorities um, to support uh, voter access and, um, uh, you know, voter expansion and, um, you know, figure out if there are legislators within the Colorado General Assembly that would be interested in um, a referred measure that would address just that piece of, um, you know, the, the uh outcome of Amendment 76, so to speak. Um, during our last conversation, we'd spent some time talking about um, one of the new representatives coming in, Megan Lukens, as a possibility. Celeste, I know, uh, I see your hand up, and I, I will turn it over to you in just a second, because I know um, you've got some uh, great information on this. Um, and um, Celeste had also had conversations with some Senate President Steve Fenberg last year, who um, was supportive of the idea. The Secretary of State is very supportive of the idea and has expressed frustration directly to us that this is not something that they want to enforce, but you know, obviously feel compelled to do it right now. Um, but they are very much in favor of um, trying to support almost 18-year-old voting um, if we can get you know the, the law situated and um, get that adjustment. Um, uh, to the to the outcome of the unfortunate outcome of Amendment 76. With that, I will turn it over to Celeste. So I would be happy to reach out to Megan Lukens. I, I know her. I even was a guest speaker in her high school history class. <laughs> That's all I was going to say. Volunteer I think that would be fantastic. And um, I think pending that conversation, the other piece would be for us to ensure that Steve Fenberg is still on board with this. Um, Celeste, I know you had had some conversations. I don't know if that's something that you'd like to pick up or if there are others in the group that you know would like to be part of that effort as kind of a relationship building type thing. Um, Celeste, I don't know if you have thoughts on that or I, I know you have a full plate, but I know this is an important He's issue to you as well. He's my state senator. Since he's my state senator, I'm happy to reach out to him. I'm also happy to let anybody else reach out to him, but um, I think he'll remember the conversation that he and I had. And um, he's also got his pulse on what can pass and what won't pass. So if he says it will pass, it will pass. And last year he didn't think it was gonna pass. And um, so we'll, and, and therefore maybe he wasn't willing to be a sponsor of it. <laughs> So we'll see. Um, yeah, I'll reach out to him. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I think I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. I think that would be fantastic in terms of next steps. And um, I, I think you're really well situated to do that. Um, did you have something else on that, Celeste? And I'll put in the chat the league, state league article that um, appeared just so everybody has a reference. Great. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, I see a hand up. Yes, I, I wish I could say that I know a ton about Amendment 76. I want to do a little bit more research on it, but um, if possible, could we, if, if I can come up with, because I'm, I'm thinking of some people that I do know um, in a little bit that you guys have just talked about, could we have same thing that we were talking about on a different topic, I think with the special districts, could we have possibly two or three speakers to get a bigger picture of what that might look like with Amendment 76 and the and the voting, um, could we do that? I think we can definitely do a discussion. Um, I, you know, in my ideal view of this, if we could secure the sponsorship and you know get um, a, a bill draft underway. Um, you know, we we often do invite bill sponsors to come and talk about um, pending legislation. It's kind of an education effort for our membership. Um, I would love to see something like that happen. Um, I think, you know, th this has been um, a priority, at least for the LAC, uh, for a while now. Um, the effort, I would say, is probably about a year and a half old when we first started exploring and doing outreach on this. Um, but, you know, we, we do want to, you know, get feedback from the group and kind of see how you all want to handle it, because um, we certainly would like to coordinate. And I think this is going to, uh, if it gains traction, it's going to take a statewide uh, education and mobilization effort um, using our local league system. So I definitely think we would want to do something along those lines to get that word out. I do think our first step is to um, 
secure sponsorship as quickly as possible um, because the legislation se legislative session is about 30 days out. Um, I think with this type of measure, since um, given the fact that Amendment 76 obviously was a constitutional amendment, um, it's going to take a referred measure from the legislature to um, put um, another uh, constitutional question on the ballot uh, for 2024. So um, because it's a referred measure, um, some of you may recall um, last meeting that Celeste had mentioned that there's an exemption for referred measures from the five bill limit that typically applies um, to legislators. So I think, you know, typically we'd be extremely worried about deadlines at this point, because I believe the deadline uh, for uh, legislators to um, start to secure their bills was the fifth. But um, because, you know, this would fall outside of their bill limit and because one of the people that we are interested in trying to bring on board for sponsorship is the Senate president, I think we have some more uh, more leeway here, so to speak. But um, we, we definitely, I think, as a first step, want to figure out where we are with possible sponsorship and if they think this is something that can go forward. Andrea, so, is, that, is that December 5th deadline? Is that for new legislators also or only returning legislators because I believe new ones have a later limit later deadline you know I was thinking that the old the existing legislator deadline was even in November but let before me look at the it election <laughs> definitely not before the election but um <laughs> let me look it up so I am not making something up and telling you all wrong I, I've got the deadline schedule here somewhere Okay, so uh, for members to request their bills, um, the deadline was November 29th. For newly elected members, the deadline is December 13th. So that has not passed yet, but we are coming up on it quickly. So yeah, just, just to kind of reiterate, normally this would be a, a really, uh, you know, kind of impossible timeline. <laughs> I think we, I think we have some room to maneuver here, but I do think we need to act quickly. Any other thoughts? Um, I definitely will make note of, you know, the need and the interest in having, you know, a discussion and an education forum on this, if we can get some traction and actually get sponsorship. Um, but if, if we can lock down that sponsorship, that, that's goal one. Anyone else? Okay, um, Celeste, let let me know if there is anything I can do to help support um, or um, you know help communicate out whatever is needed. Um, please just let us know, um, and we will definitely be discussing this <laughs> once we figure out you know the result of those conversations. Okay. Um, okay, we are. Nearly out of time, and before we start another discussion and I forget about our next meeting, let's address that, and then likely we will not get to the other items that are listed here, and um, we would love for all of you to let us know if there's anything really pressing that you want to see addressed by this group sooner rather than later that can go on um, uh, a soon-to-come agenda for one of our upcoming meetings. Um, but uh, to try and lock in um, a meeting time, there was some comment last last meeting that uh, sticking with the lunch hour, if we're looking at daytime, is probably more feasible for people than other times of the day. Um, evening was causing a lot of conflict with the various other task forces, so there's not a lot of free evenings on the LWBCO calendar. Um, and I think there was also interest in meeting um, on a biweekly basis. Um, some of the task forces are meeting by biweekly, others are meeting once a month. Um, I think biweekly does make sense here, particularly since we are trying to um, potentially move legislation. Um, although for this month, that would two weeks out would put us at December 21st. And I know the holidays do tend to be kind of a tricky time for people. Um, it hits a little ahead, um, but what are people's thoughts on that? Is the lunch hour uh, a feasible time slot for most people? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, barring no strong objections, we'll go with that. And and keep in mind, we know that we're all here. Because, you're all here. So we're <laughs> so, not the the general uh, audience. <laughs> And, and I know that the lunch hour was considered for the general audience that is not here thinking that, you know, people with, um, you know, more of a standard eight to five schedule that may have less flexibility. Um, the lunch hour might be a decent possibility. Um, so I know we're not going to find a time that works for everybody, but if we want to continue to try and stick with the lunch hour for now, if we get feedback or if you all hear things from people that are potentially interested in joining this group that the lunch hour is a really bad time, um, then you know we can always revisit. Um, but maybe we stick with that for now. Um, two weeks out would put us at the 21st. Is that a feasible day for most people? Keeping in mind that we we will record the meetings, we know that schedules are busy, so likely people won't be able to always make them. But if you generally think a biweekly schedule would work, I think that would be be good for what we're trying to accomplish here. I think the twenty first would be good because then we have you know Christmas obviously and New Year's, and so that one would either put us at the fourth or the eleventh of January, depending on what people want. So I think the twenty first would be good to wrap things up prior to um, the holidays and just kind of have some things tacked down before then. That is a great point, Hannah. And if the office calendar is looking decent for that day, let's go ahead and plan on that. Perfect, let's, yeah, do that. All right, and then, um, we will hold over the other discussion points. Oh, there is one other business item that I want to just go ahead and make a plug for. Um, you don't necessarily have to answer now, but if there is anyone on the call that would like to serve as the point person for the group, um, you know, basically facilitate meetings, um, help build the agenda. Of course, everyone has got, you know, uh, we welcome input on the agenda from everyone, but I'm just kind of looking for a point person. If anyone is interested in taking on that role, um, it is a role that will be supported by staff. Hannah and I, Beth, Maud, <laughs> you'll have a team to support you. So if anyone is inclined to do that, um, feel free to let us know now <laughs> uh, if you're feeling bold at the moment or um, you know, feel free to send an email or give us a call if, if you want to percolate on that. But it's it's definitely an ongoing need. Um, we're, we're really looking to have um, a member of the task force outside of staff kind of be um, the point if we can do that. Um, but one way or another, we will make this work. So let us know if you have any interest in that. Um, and then the other items um, that you see on that bullet point list, we'll plan to carry those over and um, if anybody has um, some pressing agenda items off the top of their head that you want to shout out now, please do so. Otherwise, know that um, you can always um, provide input to us on, you know, discussion items or um, issues that you'd like to see come up on a future agenda. Just a quick clarification, December 21st noon is what we decided for our next meeting. That's right. Yes, and I'm going to send a follow up email to all of you after this at some point today with um, the video recording uh, info for the next meeting and then all notes and chat resources type stuff so you have all of that. But yes, to answer your and what Andrea said, that is the date. Um, the other thing that I found today is I needed to go to the uh, Colorado League website to events and to register for this in order to get the link to this group. So if that's the case, um, I would put that in the email and so that somebody who's not here today knows that that's how you can get in, that's how you get the link, because it could be that we miss some people. Absolutely, thank you. All right, well, um... We are at the one o'clock hour. So um, in the interest of being respectful of everyone's busy schedules and um, you know the, the time that you plan to commit today, uh, we'll go ahead and close things out. But um, 
let us know if there are any thoughts that you would like to share in the meantime. And otherwise, we will be looking forward to picking up the conversation on the 21st. Okay. Thank Have you, Andrew. Day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye.